Hello, hello again. So today we are going to finish up 1.3 and I hope finish up, start and finish up 1.4. Um, it's not a super long section. So in 1.3, we'd introduced vectors and we'd said, we can add vectors and we can perform scalar multiplication. The next thing I'd like to do is to go over some properties of vector addition and scalar multiplication. And before I do that, I want to sort of give the take home message which is that vector addition and scalar so multiplication act like you would expect. So if you think of this list of properties as a list of eight things that have to be committed to memory, it's, it might be a little overwhelming. But if you think of it in these terms, None of the eight properties I'm going to put on the board should be very surprising. Um, so for example, when you perform addition, order doesn't matter. The, the commutative property that, for example, three plus seven equals seven plus three. Well, when we add vectors, order doesn't matter. V plus U equals U plus V. Numbers have a property called associativity, which says that when you're adding three things together, it doesn't matter where the parentheses go. Vectors have the property of associativity that says when you're adding three things together, it doesn't matter where the parentheses go. Numbers have the property that when you add a zero to a number, it doesn't change. If we define the zero vector to be the vector of all zeros, then vectors have the property that if you add the zero vector, it doesn't change anything. So again, all we're saying here when you boil it down to the essentials is that vectors act like numbers. They act like integers. Numbers have the property that every number has an additive inverse. And that sounds fancy, but all it really means is that you can make numbers negative. If you've got five, you also have negative five. And five plus negative five is a zero. If we have a vector, we can define a negative vector. Uh, we, we can do that formally using scalar 
multiplication. Negative V is negative one times V. Just like five plus negative five is zero. V plus negative V is the zero vector. So again, vectors act like numbers. We are halfway through this list. So when you're dealing with numbers, multiplication distributes over addition, like two times five plus seven is the same as two times five plus two times seven. So vectors, similar property. If we've got a scalar C times a sum V plus U, that distributes over addition in the same way that numbers do. And then we have another distributive property. So five and six look similar, but in five, you're adding two vectors together. In six, you're adding two numbers together. Two scalars. Seven, I guess seven is the property that looks the least like, um, well, but that's not true. Even seven, um, when we're multiplying real numbers, We can put parentheses in, and it's not going to change the product. This is going to be 70, whether you multiply the 5 and the 7 first, or whether you multiply the 2 and the 5 first. So this is similar to something we know once again. Scalar multiplication is associative, just like, just like number multiplication. Now that I have it on the board, I don't know why I started to say that it's, um, that it's a little unusual. It's exactly the property that we expect multiplication to have. And eight, if you multiply a real number by one, it doesn't change the real number. If you scale or multiply a vector by one, it does not change the vector. So, Again, I mean, this is a list of properties. We went through it a little fast because I hope you're not going to, you know, print this list out and study it and try to memorize these one by one. I hope, again, that you'll recognize what these properties are saying, which is that addition and multiplication act the way we're used to them acting. So we have a few other 
sort of stray comments to make about vectors. Stray does not mean unimportant. It just means that, in fact, it's sort of the opposite because vectors are so important. There's a lot of material in the vector section. We can visualize vectors graphically sometimes. Say, um, a not very emphatic statement. Let's try to be more, uh, more concrete. We can graph vectors in R2. And it's been in my notes, but I don't think like in the class I've um, ever used that notation before. So a brief um, digression, Rn is a way of writing vectors. We assume we're talking about column vectors. that have n entries. So vectors in R2 have two entries. They look like that. And the reason we can graph vectors in R2 is that a vector in R2 is essentially an ordered pair, A first, B second. And if we have an ordered pair of numbers, there's already a way that we visualize those graphically. I'm talking about the Cartesian plane. If we have an ordered pair of numbers, say five comma two, here's five, here's two, here's five comma two. And we graph vectors in a very closely related way. To graph the vector five, two, well, we start with the point five, two, and then we connect the origin and that point, and we turn this line segment into an arrow. So there's our visualization of the vector 5, 2. And you see, I mean, why I talk about graphing vectors in R2, it's because drawing the Cartesian plane is easy. Um, in theory, we can visualize vectors in R3 using three-dimensional graphs. Once we get to R4, we can no longer visualize vectors in this way. But this visualization is important. Even if we can't do it, for vectors in R4 or R5 or any of the higher dimensions, this visualization really sort of causes two major facts to jump out at us. And one of those facts is that vectors have directions. 
Do you see we have an arrow? It's pointing somewhere. So vectors have directions. Vectors also have lengths. This line segment here has a length. And this is of the utmost importance. We won't really get to why it's of the utmost importance until later in the course. In chapter four, it will be really important to think of vectors as having directions. In chapter five, both the directions and the lengths will be important. For now, we're just making the observation. This is something that vectors have that real numbers do not have. At least, well, at least the way we normally think of real numbers. And we've already talked about arithmetic. We can talk about arithmetic graphically as well. Um, this is something we do when we're teaching very young children about addition. So one way, at least in the American school system, that we teach children about addition is to use a number line. We say, okay, here's a number line. There's zero, that's one, that's two. Zero, one, two, three. Here is four on a number line. And here is three on a number line. So to create seven on a number line, to create three plus four, we just take the four and we take the three and we put them together. We move the three next to the four. And here's our visual demonstration that four plus three is seven. We do something very similar with vector addition. In fact, I would say it's more or less identical. If you have Two vectors, and you want to add them. One way of thinking about that addition is to take the vectors and move them so that one begins where the other ends. It's exactly like we did here. We moved the three so it begins where the four ends. Here, if we take that vector and move it so that it begins where the other vector ends, there is the sum of those two vectors. And of course, I shouldn't say of course, that's just when I say, of course, I'm just, it, it's just a habit. I fill dead space with it. It doesn't mean that you, the student, should find something obvious. Um, it's just, uh, 
a tape of mine. Um, what I was starting to say was that vector addition is commutative, and that's reflected here by the fact that if we take this vector and we move it, So it begins where the other vector ends. We wind up in exactly the same place. And this is, you think I'd know how to spell a parallelogram at this point in my mathematical career, but you'd be wrong. Give me a second to Google it. Addition is sometimes said to be done according to the parallelogram rule or law or principle because you see this picture of addition that we have um created, we've drawn a parallelogram. Excuse me, just a second. Cool, cool. Sorry, something I absolutely could not put off. Um, so this is Shoot. I mean, we get a nice picture out of it. But um, it's not of a lot of practical use, I think it's fair to say. I mean, this isn't how you do addition. If you want to add one, seven, plus three, four, you're not going to bust out your graph paper. You're going to say, well, addition is done component-wise. One, here, let me, because this is still new, let me write it out. One plus three. Seven plus four. Four, eleven. So you don't do the parallelogram, use the parallelogram rule, I should say, to actually do addition. Um, it's going to be useful, I think, at one point in this class. Otherwise, you can, you can mentally sort this under fun facts and not worry about it too much. By contrast, understanding what scalar multiplication does is extremely important. Scalar multiplication is where, this is where the word scalar comes from. I mean, you might have seen that scalar multiplication is multiplying a vector by a real number, and you might have thought, well, why not just call it real multiplication or number multiplication? Why, why this word? Well, this word because scalar multiplication scales the length of a vector. And again, we won't really start talking about lengths of vectors until maybe chapter four, chapter five, but chapters four and five 
are where we present some of the most important applications of linear algebra. So it's really crucial that we understand this. If here is a vector V, this vector has some length, the length of that line segment. Then let me see my art skills. There's a reason I'm a, a math teacher and not an art teacher. But if we multiply V by two, for example, what multiplying V by two is going to do is it's going to double its length. It's going to multiply its length by two. Whereas it's going to not change the direction of the vector. So scalar multiplication changes the length of the vector, but not the direction. With one exception, scalar multiplication by, let's say, alpha increases the length of the vector by a factor of alpha without changing the direction. Eh? And then I said there was an exception, except if alpha is negative on um, the direction is perfect reversed. And this is one of those things where you see it written and it means practically nothing, but this, um, once you see an example, everything hopefully springs into focus. So let's say here is the vector V. And let's look at one at negative one half V. So our new vector will be twice, sorry, will be one half as long as the old vector. Oh, what a color choice, pink on red. No idea what I was thinking there, but the new vector will be half as long as the old vector, except whereas the old vector is pointing in that direction, the new vector will be pointing in the opposite direction. So the new vector will be pointing off into the third quadrant. So notice that the old vector and the new vector are still on the same line, but they're pointing in different directions on that line. One of them's up and to the right, 
the other is down and to the left. Any questions about this so far? Then one more thing to say. If we have addition of vectors and we have scalar multiplication, we can talk about equations involving vectors. And a vector equation might look like some unknown. So how should I put it? The vectors in a vector equation are known. So you have however many vectors you have, and you know what these vectors are. And there's going to be a vector B on the other side of the equal sign, and that vector is also known. So those vectors are known. A vector equation looks like this. A scalar times the first vector plus a scalar times the second vector plus and so on until you reach the nth vector equals b. And our unknowns here are the scalars c1, c2, c3, up until Cn. And the good news is that you um, solve vector equations using Gauss-Jordan elimination, which if you've been doing the Gauss-Jordan elimination by hand, that probably doesn't seem like good news. It probably seems like an enormous pain, but we're going to learn to do Gauss-Jordan elimination on the calculator today. And once we know how to do that, it will be quick and hopefully easy. And the reason I originally called it good news is that it means we're not having to learn a different technique. Instead of having one method of solving a system of linear equations and a second method for solving vector equations, and we have to master them both, we just have the one method, Gauss-Jordan elimination. And let's see why this is true, first of all. C1 times 1, 3, plus C2 times 4, 7, equals 6, negative 1. Here's an example of a vector equation. So the way scalar multiplication is defined we can bring the C1 and the C2 into the vectors. And then the way addition is defined we can do the addition, 1C1 plus 4C2 
3C1 plus 7C2 is 6, negative 1. And then I'm not sure if I ever actually put the definition of a quality on the board, but two vectors are equal if their components are equal. So for these vectors to be equal, one C1 plus four C2 has to be six. And three C1 plus seven C2 has to equal negative one. And both those things have to be true. So you have a system of linear equations. And a system of linear equations is solved by writing down the augmented system. And performing Gauss Jordan elimination on it. So, summarizing that, a vector equation is solved by writing down an augmented matrix that has this first vector as its first column, this second vector as its second column, and so on, and is then augmented with the B vector. And you perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on it, and you'll get C1, C2, up to Cn. So again, remember when we have an augmented matrix, our columns correspond to um, unknowns, except for the last column, which corresponds to equality. And let's perform the Gauss-Jordan elimination, not by hand, but using our calculator. And it's, it's a little bit of a nuisance because, you know, Texas Instruments has had a monopoly for decades and have therefore not felt compelled to, uh, to improve their services, but it's not that bad. It's just gonna take a few more button presses than you might think it should. So that's one, four, six, three, Seven, negative one. Let's go to the calculator. No idea what that's about. Here we are, and now that's move things over so you can see a bit better. So we see a matrix in blue up here. And our calculator is color coded. You see stuff in blue and in green above the buttons. And then up here, you see a blue button and a green button. And to get to the blue matrix menu, you press the blue second button, and then this x to the negative first button, and 
That brings us to this menu. And this menu hasn't really changed again since the TI-83. So you might see minor differences if you're using an older version of this. But you'll see something that looks basically like this. Here are the names we're allowed to give our menu, our matrices. We can navigate up and down using the up and down buttons. If we press the right button, we get to the math menu. This is where we do stuff. So the reduced row echelon form process, the Gaussian elimination is going to be done in here. But first we need to give to store our matrix. So we press the right arrow over again, we get to, um, edit, and we press the enter key, and now we can input a matrix. And the first thing our calculator wants to know is how big this matrix is. So it's two by three, two rows, three columns. So we press the two button, entry, the three button, press the plus by mistake, the three button, entry, and we get a two by three matrix. It's filled with zeros to begin with, and we have to go and enter the numbers that we have. So one, enter four, enter six, Enter three, enter seven, enter. Sometimes students get error messages because they try to use subtract the subtraction button to create the negative sign. But the negative button is down here, right next to the enter button. Negative one, enter. And we are done. And the one sort of, to me, weird thing about this is that as far as I know, there is no way to just go back to the matrix menu from this screen. Instead, we see quit in blue up here. We press second. We press mode, but really we're pressing quit because of this blue button. We get out, and then we go back in to the matrix menu, and we go over to math, and we scroll down a bit. So the process of putting matrices into reduced row echelon form is called Gauss-Jordan elimination, but on your calculator, it's just R-R-E-F, short for reduced row echelon form. We select enter, we get kicked out of the matrix menu a second time. We go back in a third time. Um, the way you know that your matrix has been stored correctly is that your calculator now has something next to A. It's telling us this is a two by three matrix. We press enter. We don't ha actually have to close the parenthesis. Uh, we will not get an error message if we don't do that. But just to be clean, I'll close the parenthesis. And we'll press enter. And our calculator 
takes this matrix and it performs Gauss-Jordan elimination on it, and it puts it right into reduced row echelon four. Um, as a side note, negative 9.2 and 3.8, those are perfectly nice. But like sometimes you get answers that are nice, but they're nice fractions. And if you write them as decimals, they become messy. So if you have some ugly decimal and you wonder, I wonder what this would look like as a fraction, you can trust math. You see this arrow to fraction button. You can select it. And that will give us um, the answer as a fraction. But no need for that here. 9.2 and 3.8 are perfectly respectable numbers. Let's see. That's a typo, that should be a zero, that was a one, and then zero, one, was it 2.8? 3.8. So, C1, is negative 9.3, negative 9.2, 9 thank you. Even though I know I have a memory of a goldfish, I try to remember stuff and it never works. So C1 is negative 9.2, C2, is 3.8. So that's how to solve vector equations. And as a side note, it's how to perform Gauss-Jordan elimination using a calculator. And that brings us to the end of this section. We're going to keep right on chugging, but let me stop this recording.